Everyone, we're going to go ahead and get started. Have some refreshments, take a seat. My name is Oscar Lopez, and I'm the current chair of the Academic Events Committee here at CAPLA. And I'm going to start uh, the evening by reading our land acknowledgement. We respectfully acknowledge the University of Arizona is on the land and territories of indigenous peoples. Today, Arizona is home to 22 federally recognized tribes, with Tucson being home to the Odom and the Yaqui. Committed to diversity and inclusion, the university strives to build sustainable relationships with sovereign native nations and indigenous communities through educational offerings, partnerships, and community service. I think more than ever, this is very fitting, especially in this evening tonight where we're coming together um, to celebrate peace and to celebrate two cultures, a partnership and a friendship. This event has been in the works for several months. We want to thank Sandra Bernal for all of her work. We want to thank everyone here. <laughs> everyone here for attending. This morning at, uh, at around 10.30, Gregorio gave uh, a beautiful talk on the work of Luis Barragan. The room was filled with over 120 architecture students and, uh, and community members. And it was very touching. For me, it was the first lecture I've attended to on Louis Barragan. And while I'm familiar with the work, uh, I'm an architect, I'm a faculty here, it is refreshing to see it through new eyes. And the way that you spoke about beauty and connecting it to the work of Louis Barragan and to inspire the students to seek and pursue beauty was very uh, touching. I want to call up Nancy, who will introduce Gregorio. Thank you. Good evening and welcome. I'm Nancy Pollock Elwan. I'm the Dean of the College of Architecture, Planning and Landscape Architecture at the University of Arizona. And I always add the proud Dean of the College of Architecture, Planning and Landscape Architecture. Well, thank you all for joining us here tonight uh, for what I know will be a unique and very interesting and engaging lecture. I can say that because uh, as uh, Oscar was saying uh, today, we had at 10.30 this uh, lecture that was just fantastic. Uh, and I know you were really touching the hearts of those students. It was mostly students, although we had some very, very uh, engaged uh, community members here as well. But the students uh, weren't on their phones. <laughs> they, were, they, were, um, they were just like this. Uh, they were uh, taking notes, uh, drawing, uh, thinking about the concepts that are being brought forward to them and, uh, and welcome by the way, <laughs> I'm glad you're here. And, uh, and it was all about that. It was about, you know, for me as an educator as well as students, receiving uh, your thoughts uh, and reflections on the work of this great uh, architect. So this didn't happen overnight. <laughs> this, these wonderful sculptures that we have, the uh, the uh, union that we are expressing here uh, with the Sakal Foundation as well as the Mexican Consulate uh, with the, the university and college. And uh, it took a lot of people. And I'm going to start with a list. Uh, first, of course, to Gregorio, Luke, uh, who uh, on behalf of the faculty and staff and students of this college, I want to extend a sincere thank you and appreciation for your gracious acceptance of our invitation uh, to be here and do two um, lectures, uh, which is quite extraordinary, to the Sakal Foundation, uh, namely the president, Sylvia Sakal, who's not here, but we are thinking about Sylvia, uh, and Claire Crodo, who is here representing uh, the foundation for bringing this work, this exhibition, to the University of Arizona. And, and if you haven't noticed, it was also in the bookstore before this and then traveled uh, over uh, to this location. And the Sakal Foundation, who brings this to us 
and they support the cost of this, which we're, we're so appreciative of, and also, of course, the presence of our esteemed Gregorio Luke uh, to be uh, giving these lectures. A special thank you also to Rafael Barceló, uh, who is the Council of Mexico. We've met many times and been many events, uh, really uh, the building of this relationship, not only with the University of Arizona, but with us in this college, which I really appreciate facilitating that connection uh, that, that now goes back um, month, years now, I think, that we're looking at. But also supporting the transportation of this exhibition, which, uh, which is a big lift, uh, literally, <laughs> uh, to bring these sculptures here uh, to Tucson and the university, and fostering this relationship that you do so well between Mexico, the Mexican-American community, the university, as well as the college. So thank you for that. And Marla Franco, uh, who's the vice president of the Hispanic Serving Institute Initiatives at the University of Arizona. And you should know that Sandra Bernal it has received a fellowship from the Hispanic, uh, his, sorry, Hispanic Serving Institute and is a fellow and has through that received uh, funding and has also directed some of that funding to us and to this exhibition. So I want to thank you uh, because it aligns, as you uh, note, it aligns with us in terms of the connection that we have to the community, especially as a land-grant uh, university. I, t I take that, and I know the others within this college take that very seriously, and in particular, the fact that we are Hispanic-serving is a very important part of our community. And then arts and design and what we do in this college every day and finding that connection and intersection that we see in this work. When I look, at this work and when as it started arriving yesterday you may not know this but we've recently renovated this space um, so 10 million dollars later uh, here we are um, and uh, what we have really brought here is this transparency uh, to this space and looking down in the, the light that comes in here to see these pieces here I know we're going to disperse them after this uh, show but having them all together here within this space really uh, is kind of a launching of our new renovation, so uh, thank you very much for that. I also want to acknowledge uh, Justin Dutram, of course, who's here, is a UA Mexico and Latin American Initiatives Vice President who joins us here, and I know you've had a large part of in organizing this event as well. And then I thank Olivia Miller, who's a director of the UA Museum of Art, and for her support in disseminating uh, the information about this event today. And lastly, I want to express, and I don't know if all of them are here, some of them are, but I want to express my gratitude. Well, first of all, to Sandra. I know that uh, we marked that, but Sandra, really. It was Sandra's idea, I think, and she started moving with this and said, well, I can connect these people. And, and I've, as I said this morning, she is our uh, official connector uh, within the college, uh, extraordinary woman. And uh, we are so pleased uh, that you had this idea and that uh, you followed through with it and kept us going along the way. So thank you, Sandra. Oscar, I want to thank you for your leadership. Uh, for this guest lecture and your kind words. Uh, Emilio uh, is here, uh, Romero, uh, I think I see him uh, someplace. I want to also uh, note, uh, and this is re being recorded and they may not be here, but I hope they uh, read, you know, hear this uh, later. Uh, Brett Smith, as well as Eric, uh, who, who come from the materials lab. And when I came here, uh, yesterday morning they were lifting these pieces <laughs> uh, up onto those pedestals and kind of positioning them. Uh, and uh, Angie, of course, uh, Angie Smith, who's, who's there, and uh, Jeff Javier, uh, who's new uh, to the, the college as our communications and marketing person. But most of all, I want to thank Lucas. Uh, I know that Lucas worked with Gregorio uh, yesterday to position everything and, and I was speaking with Gregorio and he said, you know, it's important that this is work that has to have the proper stage. And so the setting of that stage was done with Gregorio yesterday and I know Lucas was very much a part of it and his team. So thank you, Lucas. And now I invite Claire Crodo from the Sakal Foundation to the podium for a few words. <laughs> was not 
not in the script. <laughs> <laughs> well, just a few. <laughs> I know. Thank you, everybody, to come here, and we are really uh, we appreciate Sandra's job. She's amazing. Without her, this couldn't be possible. And Consul, you, everybody, Gregorio, a good friend, a very good friend of Jose Sacal. We, well, you guys were best friends. So he knows him very, very well. So the lecture that he's gonna tell you today is uh, from a very close friend of Sacal. He knows him perfectly. He knew him very well. Um, this exhibition is, we are very honored to be here and this place is amazing. And with all my heart and Sylvia Sakal heart, we thank you all. And well, let's hear you. Gregorio <laughs> Luque. Thank you everybody. Thank you. I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> we have, uh, I'm sorry. Um, so, Rafael, uh, there's going to be some comments uh, from the consulate as well. And then we will have Gregorio, so there we go. Well, I, I won't take a lot of, a lot of time because we, we're here to listen to, to Gregorio, I, but, I, but I really wanted to recognize and to thank um, Nancy Paul, the one that you, you, you have given us tremendous support. And I think we are part of this ecosystem of organizations that work together as a community and I think that is fantastic and I think the work of Jose Sacal reflects on that in the unity of communities uh, we, we have mentioned the beauty of his work um, be, goes beyond goes, goes to the meaning um, I was um, I couldn't attend in person the conversation this morning but I attended it in soul so I was listening to the conversation uh, through Facebook Live. We are uh, broadcasting in the social media of the consulate also this conversation. So more people get to find out, um, particularly to seek beauty. I think that's something that all the communities need to do to come together uh, and to build new futures, better futures. We need to build them. And we need to build them with, with beauty. And I think that's what architecture is all about. So thank you so much. Um, and thank you also to the artists of the United by Art a joint exhibition that with Capla and the Consulate of Mexico uh, with the curatorship of Sandra we organize. Uh, several of them are here and we're extremely happy uh, to keep building this community. So thank you so much and Gregorio, please, we are so, we are so blessed and we are so, we feel so privileged to have you here uh, and we are, um, we cannot wait to, to hear to the wonderful things that you always share with us. So thank you so much. Thank you much. Uh, I am very honored to be here. Uh, Thank you, Dean, for your lovely words, and the consul, and Sandra. I also wanted to mention uh, my colleagues, uh, Claire Crudeau and uh, Mario Torres, that have worked so hard. And uh, I don't know, this, uh, this, this morning uh, was one of the most moving lectures in my career. I was just so touched. It was full of students. And, and the right, I mean, it's the first time, I, I hadn't remarked on it, but it's the first time that I, I'm present in a, in a meeting where there was not a single cell phone being used or a text being done. And uh, at the end, I mean, some of the students were just crying and hugging. And, 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 and feeling that they too could be an artist. And that architecture is an art and that beauty is important for living. So it was very moving and, and I think that it's not an accident that we have this exhibit here because it's the same theme. And now what, what we want is you students of architecture to see, especially see this work because 
what Sakal is doing here is taking a bi-dimensional image, like a painting, and making it three-dimensional. So of course, your task is even harder because an architect should make it an environment, right? Uh, it's a Mexican poet, Carlos Pellicer, that said, uh, fortunately, nobody knows what art is. Uh, Sakal has an interesting definition. He said, uh, art cannot be defined or explained. It is like a spark, a lightning rod that for seconds illuminates the horizon and reveals what has been covered by darkness. So it's, there you have it. And what Claire was saying is true. Most of the artists that I talk about, I have known through their works or through their words. Uh, this morning I was asked if I knew Barragan. I could have. I was alive, I was an adult when he was still alive, but I didn't never know him. But I did know Pepe Sacal. And I traveled with him and we went to China together. And I saw him uh, do his sculptures and I heard him talk. Uh, he was the greatest gourmet I've ever met in my life. I cannot imagine what it was to eat Chinese food with Jose Sacal in Hong Kong and try all the different dumplings. And there's like, maybe we tried about nine, ten. Uh, and, uh, and then you could see him morphing into different things. Uh, he was, for instance, an expert in cloth. In, he could tell a good fabric just by touching it. And uh, I remember in China, you know, they always try to hustle you. And, uh, and the way, one of the ways that they do it is that they show you a little book. And then they bring you and they make you walk five floors. And by the time you get to the fifth floor, you're so tired that you buy anything. <laughs> Pain. I don't know if any of you have tried to buy things in China. And so they got us up seven floors. I was like, I came tired. And then came the hustle and they showed us. And suddenly, I see a new Sakal that I did not know, the businessman who looked at the guy straight in the eye, he was asking us, I don't know, a thousand words. He says, I give you 400 and I give it now and then not get me the hell out of here. <laughs> and he got the deal. <laughs> I was like, so uh, anyway, this is for Pepe. I, uh, I have uh, a lot of admiration of him. I'm so glad to be able to talk about him. And, and uh, to share his work. And I, right now I was showing them to, and he was very keen on touching sculpture. Even one of his, the Cervantes, you can move it. But of course we're taught that you can't touch art, right? So right now I found myself hugging the scream and, you know, because these, these, uh, these sculptures are like my family. I've, I've lived with them so, so long, you know. Uh, now, I also wanted to say of Sakal, again, to the benefit of the young artists here. I don't know, it's like oppression is everywhere. You know, the making you into a commodity a product that can be sold and bought, making you into a piece of merchandise. So, believe it or not, that happens a lot in the art world. Many artists 
make some type of work that is successful. And then the galleries start selling it. And there is an enormous pressure for that artist to keep doing exactly the same thing. And if the artist changes, they say, You're, it's bad for your market. And many artists have fallen into this temptation. I mean, look at Andy Warhol. Same silk screens over and over, whether it is now or whatever, but it's the same. It's so common that an artist doesn't becomes a manufacturer of his own work. What could be sadder than that? Copying yourself forever and ever. Because God forbid you try something different, then what if it doesn't sell? So of course Sakal didn't give a damn about the market. And kept changing his works. And you will see here, he starts doing like all these torsos and bodies. And, and as soon as they start getting popular and commercial, starts doing animals. And then something else. And this constant idea that if, if you are not sincere, in your creations. You're not honest. So if you're just repeating yourself to make money, you're betraying yourself. Eso Sakal, till the very last moment, kept reinventing himself, kept creating works that he believed in. And I think that's a sign of great artists. Yes, of course, it's important to develop a style, sure. Course. I'm not saying not. You need a style. But you also need to be able to reinvent yourself if you so choose to be. And you have the right to be the master of your own destiny. That's very important for your, your happiness. You know? And so Sakal is an example of this idea. Uh, he's, uh, he has a very interesting background. His, uh, his father and his grandfather uh, were soldiers of Lawrence of Arabia in Syria. I think the grandfather was the cook. And uh, and they met Lawrence of Arabia, this incredible man, author of the Seven Pillars of Wisdom, uh, a liberator of the Middle East. And uh, a man who, more than 100 years later, his, his reputation is untarnished. Nobody has come up with any revelation that has tarnished him. Accuse him of being gay, but what, what an honor. You know? And so, th these soldiers of Lawrence of Arabia want to come to America. And uh, it's, it's very difficult. Uh, Sakal's father, you know, there's a lot of British soldiers in Syria and Damascus. And, he peddles what he can. He sells them uh, cigarettes and lighters, and, uh, anything he can. And uh, he uh, is able to, to sneak in a ship uh, to Cuba. And he arrives in Cuba, doesn't speak a word of Spanish, and is immediately put in jail. He says, you know, that jail was a blessing for me because I learned Spanish. And I was fed and I had a roof <laughs> over my head. So finally, some of his relatives in Mexico uh, get him over to Mexico. 
And uh, he, like many, uh, many Jews of that time, uh, start selling clothes on credit. So they go in a, you know, they carry these big sacks of clothes and, uh, and they start selling clothes to, to, to people that supposedly could not buy, like the maids and the kids. And, and they sell them on credit. So they get a hundred pesos every month or so on. It's a huge market. But of course, you have to toil a lot and work. You know, a lot of fortunes were made like this. And so uh, he, he was also a very good gambler. He knew how to play the roulette and play poker. He was very astute. And, uh, and uh, he marries uh, Alicia Micha and has a, puts a, Jose is the oldest boy, it's a big family, and uh, he opens a store where they sell clothing, whatever. Okay. And uh, in that environment, what mattered was the business. And it was expected that the children participate in the store. But the problem for Jose Sacal is he's kind of shy, he's an introverted guy. And it was difficult for him to sell things. He didn't like to do it, he was not good at, very good at it. And so what he started to do was he did, did the, 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 how do you say vitrinas in English? The escaparates. The, with the, with the kind of the window thing you put in the front door. Display. The display cabinet, right? And so he used laces and this and that. And uh, then he would tell me, you know, really, those were my first installations. And with the advantage that I had immediate feedback. Because either the piece is sold or they didn't. <laughs> So I could know if my display was good or not. And so he starts learning how to control how the people look at things and, and the objects and how to place them and, 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 and the distance and how do you put something. And so he starts thinking aesthetically, not with any artistic goal, but simply to survive, right? And of course, the father he, he loves to draw and to paint, but the father had absolutely none of that. Kidding me? A struggling Jewish family and the oldest son wants to be an artist? To hell with that. Absolutely not. No way. He says, you have to be a doctor. But I want you to, I, I want to, sh I, I put a little emphasis on the education part of him because again this is for the students and I want you to see how you can turn anything into an opportunity so here is this guy it's a little heavy set doesn't feel too too good about himself uh, in medicine and in those days if you were a student of medicine, they give you, they gave you a cadaver, a real body for you to do your practices on. So every medical student received his body, his cadaver. I don't think they do that anymore. <laughs> and uh, and so Sakal uh, learns all about the body from the inside and understands how the muscles work and the bones work and he's, uh, the veins, he starts painting them in different colors. So he gets an understanding of human anatomy that no student of sculpture can get. I mean, a student of sculpture does not get to, to open a body and, and look how it's built and stretch the muscles and paint them and put them colors. 
So, uh, and, you know, he, he's in surgery and he's all these things, and, and all the time he's learning about anatomy. And then he goes into psychiatry. And I remember Sakal telling me how we all wear these masks, these social masks. But when you are in, in a mental ward and you see the uninhibited human expression, it's just another world. We're not used to see people that are completely uninhibited, that give you the full range of human expression. To all, he understands the, the, the limits. He tries to teach these mental patients art. And he can see how they represented aggression with teeth and nails. All this is very important for him. And at the same time, subversively, he's going to art school. But this is like a secret. And uh, he meets one of the great Latin American sculptors, Francisco Zuniga. Zuniga was born in, in Costa Rica, but he did most of his career in Mexico. I'm sure you've seen his work. He is very important because until then, the only parameter of beauty was Western beauty. You know, you look at Michelangelo da Vinci, all that is Western beauty. I'm surprised there's no more sculptures of Zuniga, especially here in Arizona, where there is, by the way, I was very touched by that thing you said at first of the indigenous presence. I mean, I felt I, I was just moved to tears by that. But he celebrates the indigenous beauty, and he does these sculptures of these massive women that are from this continent, that are non-Western. And they're so beautiful. And so this is kind of the core nationalistic type of sculpture that is exactly the opposite to what Sakal would do. But Sakal becomes Suñiga's favorite disciple. And uh, I would tell him, what was it like? He said, he didn't, didn't tell me anything. He just encouraged me. He didn't want me to copy him. He wanted me to find my own voice, which is the sign of a good teacher. Said, I wanted to encourage you to find yourself, right? And most of the, the, the workshop of Sakal were people that worked for Suñiga. He kind of inherited the workshop. That is the craftsmanship of these pieces. It's just a surprise. A lot of people that worked for Suñiga later worked for Sakal. And uh, so this is his life. His father has a heart attack. He has to go full time to the, to the store. And uh, he meets this, this, this girl, uh, Sylvia Farca, that is of a much higher uh, social class, that is much more cosmopolitan, is a woman that studies in the American school, is very fluent, has been in Woodstock, and knows the museums, knows everything, right? And, uh, and this dazzling woman. Unfortunately, I think this is a piece that is lost, but I, it's one of my favorites. It's uh, uh, Sakal's tribute to Sylvia, his wife, and it's the figure of Venus with the hair, because Sylvia has this kind of curly hair. Uh, can't believe, can't, it's so beautiful, the, the, the Venus. And, uh, so this gorgeous woman, she could have chosen anybody she wanted, but she kind of likes this kind of uh, shy boy, you know, that is, has all these ideas. And, and she uh, agrees to marry him. And Sylvia is a lot wealthier, and she comes from a family that make wedding dresses. 
They are the most important. And in a Jewish family, you are supposed to incorporate yourself to the family business. So Sakan now becomes a maker of dresses and a photographer. And so he's looked at these, these bodies naked in, in his anatomy classes. He has seen people suffering paranoia and schizophrenia. And now he has to take these wedding dresses. A lot of them are made in the US or in Europe. And he has to adapt them to Mexican bodies that are very different from the French or the American. They fall differently. So he has to understand how does the body look when it's clothed. And he has to learn all about the textures and how do you use the fabric and how do you... Uh, and they become very, very successful, which is another uh, element of genius is that guy. Like, I've never met a guy that was equally talented as an artist and, and as a businessman and has this incredible capacity of, of reinvention. And uh, so they're very successful and they start traveling a lot. Sylvia kind of takes him and make sure that he sees every museum, that he knows every country. And, they, and then their trips are not just conventional trips. They, they, they stay in New Guinea's uh, with the original inhabitants there. They go to China before it was opened. Uh, they live in the in the North Pole, they visit the Antarctica. Uh, they are uh, in safaris in Africa. Uh, so this uh, connection with human beings of everywhere, all different types of human beings, uh, is also a tremendous uh, influence. And uh, Sakal is able to be successful enough. Uh, but you see the talent everywhere. At some point, the, there's a fire, and all the, the factories of dresses burn, and then they have NAFTA, and suddenly you have all the competition. You cannot possibly compete, because suddenly <laughs> The dresses that you were doing in Mexico are competing with products in China that cost 10 times less. And everybody would say, oh, would have a nervous breakdown. Not Sakal. I remember telling me, all, at one point his business burned down, and he told me that's the greatest blessing. Because then, he, 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 in his travels, he had seen jewelry centers. And so he said, I want to make one of those. And so he takes this old place, and he makes these tiny little cubicles and he rents it out and he makes the first jewelry center in Mexico City. It makes him even more successful. And, uh, and so then he starts doing these workshops. His first uh, sculptures are of the human body. Uh, Sylvia, I don't know if she still does, but at the time she had these terrible headaches. And so he, he does this migraine piece of a person that has a an excruciating headache. But of course, it has been interpreted as many things. You know, it could be suffering, it could be other. And then he works with the human figure, and then he started elongating it. And suddenly, you know, making, the, taking the body, and changing it, and doing, uh, he does these torsos, and they're wildly popular. Look at this this uh, female torso that he cuts into sex and, uh, and the male torso. And he starts to sell them like hotcakes. You know, they start, they, there's some of them in China, everywhere. 
Uh, and then he also does fragments of the body. He's very famous for his feet. And sometimes people think, oh, feet are horrible and they're smelly and they're all covered. Why would anyone want to do something with the feet? I remember I was with Sakal in China where he unveiled the exhibit of the feet. And suddenly I saw these women, especially the older generations, sobbing with the feet. And then I understood that one of the greatest signs of female oppression was foot binding, which meant that a woman was forced to wear these metal shoes that made it impossible for the feet to grow. And this way, women could not escape the tyranny of their husbands. And so, for somebody to, to, to recreate the free feet in China was like uh, the women's lib movement in the US. Very powerful. I could not understand that, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't realize that. What, the, the kind of emotion that we were provoking there with these sculptures that are just so beautiful and, and so meaningful for people. And I could never th think that a sculptures of feet could become uh, a, 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 a symbol of freedom for women that could not use their feet and were prisoners of that for the rest of their lives. And this is one of my favorite sculptures of Sakal, which is total invention. It's uh, the hand feet. I can't tell you how many trophies have, have been made of this, it's handed out like, there's a lovely piece. Again, something totally original, you know, the foot and the hand. But again, to the depression of the galleries, and he suddenly stopped doing figures and feet. And I remember Sylvia telling me, he said, but babe, but do a little bit more. It's, it's going good. <laughs> no. And now he starts doing animals. And the animals of Sakal are something else. He does them in all sizes, it's like the shark. Uh, once in Mexico City, they took all his animals to the zoo. And so you could see Sakal's animals interacting with the real animals. I wanted to put them in the cages, but they didn't allow us. But, you know, the, the horses, the roosters, the cat. And there's plazas in Mexico that have the cat and the mouse, no? Because these little sculptures can also be Monumental, look at the giant mouse. And uh, whales. He loves this, these whales and, and they have little tuercas. Uh, I don't know how you say that in English. All the, the bolts. And here you see a giant foot hand and body. Torsos. He also did miniatures. Sakal was a, a, a great gourmet. He, he knew all the best chefs in the world and he manufactured uh, little necklaces and especially cutlery. Spoons and uh, knives. And he, he, if he found a chef that he thought was particularly brilliant, he gave him a spoon uh, that he had done. But look how lovely these are. They made a fortune just doing them in series and selling them. Uh, also, Sakal is very proud of his Jewish identity and he does these 
very dramatic uh, sculptures on the Holocaust. Like, like this, this, this image that is a, a star of David with a, a cadaver. Or this one that is made with six million stones, those spears. And then he does the spirits floating above the six million little stones that he did. But he was aware of things that were happening today. Mexico has been suffering an epidemic of, of violence. Porfirio Diaz used to say, poor Mexico, you know, so far from God and so close to the United States. <laughs> I mean, all the drug problem. Imagine. I don't know how many billions of dollars are bought in drugs. What, 100 billion, something like that. And, uh, and you can buy an unlimited amount of weapons right here. You can go out there and you can buy a new seat. Imagine what that does to a country that is poor, where the mafias can have access to $100 billion and as many weapons as they want. What government can survive that? When you have hoodlums that are better armed than the army and have more money than the banks and are supported by the misery of our people. the slavery of the drug addiction that nobody seems too interested in doing anything about. Here we have our kids languishing now, that hideous legal pot that is a narcotic. They took one of the best things of the 60s and made it into these merchants of death sell you these pipes that kill you. All for the money. And so Mexico has become a den of violence, of crime, of mafias that are unstoppable. And Sakal reflects that violence in his work. He does these uh, skulls that are not the charming Day of the Dead ones, but the awful reality of, of a country that is shaken by, by violence that cannot control because it comes from the outside and is finite from the outside and is armed from the outside. And uh, all these weapons, it doesn't matter how many kids are killed in kindergartens. And the weapons continue to be made and continue to be sold and nobody seems to be able to stop them. And that's here. Imagine over there. So Sakal does this mighty piece that is called Armado Hasta Los Dientes, Armed to the Teeth. And it has almost like a biblical resonance. I mean, Cain kills Abel with a jaw. So here you have this jaw that is full of bullets and missiles like a symbol of death. But Sakal, at the same time that he denounces death and violence, can also do things for the children. And he does these lovely sculptures for children. These teddy bears. Uh, some of these sculptures are uh, in, the, there is one recently donated to the, the student uh, St. St. John's. St. Jude, of, of, of young kids that have cancer. And uh, he did a teddy bear for these beautiful, he did this teddy bear that has two faces. And so this is the front. So the teddy bear is sad because you're coming into the hospital as a, as a kid. And so the teddy bear is in paddock with the sick kid. And then on the other side, he's happy when you're leaving the hospital. So this is one of the few documents where you will actually see and meet Jose Sacar. 
talk about the exhibit that that we have here uh, I think it's again uh, another example of Sakal's courage because as I said you know he takes these famous iconic paintings and gives them a three-dimensional this is like the famous Grant Wood uh, inspired in the Grant Wood piece of American Gothic. And notice how he fuses the features of the man and the woman and, of course, the trench. This is another very famous artwork called The Scream. And what Monk does in his scream is to show us not only the expression of pain, but also the landscape as seen by somebody in despair. How do you give, how do you do justice to a piece like this? And somehow Sakal manages to, to give us the anxiety and somehow to recreate in the cut body the environment that it represents. Some of the works are a lot of fun. This is a famous Velázquez piece. And of course, uh, you know the fantasy of a lot of men with what, what does the girl behind the skirt look like? And so he does left a little opening. And then other sculptures that are just so famous. Everybody knows the David or Moses. Or the Mona Lisa. Here, for instance, he tries to recreate the, the smile of the Mona Lisa. Not just the smile, but in the form of the sculpture. By the way, uh, I, you probably don't know this, but people know the, the happy part of the Mona Lisa, this girl that da Vinci kept happy and brought musicians. But at the same time, after painting him, he went to, to dissect cadavers and see how the mouth was built and how the lips were built. 
And, and so he combines in this perfect painting his knowledge of anatomy and the posing of La Gioconda. Georgia O'Keeffe did a lot of work in Arizona. Uh, she's very famous for the flowers uh, that she does. But she also used to do buildings. And so this is a piece that was just very difficult to do. I must confess that I didn't see what was so remarkable about it until Sylvia told me, what? That's a technically virtuosic. Anybody that to do the foundry and get the little holes and that, that took us forever. And we had to do it again and again and again until we got it right. And then Picasso's great anti-war mural, Guernica. A mural so powerful that it doesn't have any place. It can happen anywhere, anytime. Not only in Spain, but do you remember that hideous speech of Colin Powell justifying the invasion of Iraq under false premises? And he did his sad announcement in the Security Council in Europe where there is a replica of Guernica. And you know what they did? They covered it. Because the painting is so powerful that they didn't want to see, you know, the American Secretary of State give his speech with Guernica watching. And uh, so I think that Sakal would have wanted to do probably a larger piece where he took the individual pieces. He, he managed to do two. The Wailing Woman and the horse that is here. Everybody knows Frida Kahlo and her most famous painting is the Two Fridas. And Sakal managed to do the Two Fridas. And I remember as a curator, I remember we sent the, the exhibit to a museum and the director calling me, Mr. Luke, I just have some terrible news to report. We've lost the Frida. There's just one. I already called my insurance. I just can't. No, it's the two, it's the two-sided Frida. <laughs> And then uh, he gets to understand not just the external part, but the internal part of an artist. Modigliani, another fabulous artist, sadly died very young. And he was in love with this girl that loved him and died after he died. And she had this very elongated neck. And so uh, Modigliani paints every woman with the neck of his lover. And so Sacal does this image that is a fusion of the works that Modigliani painted and his lover. This is the beautiful lover of Modigliani. And you kind of look at it, you want to give it a kiss, you want to hug it. It's just so lovely, you know? This piece of Cervantes that is now at the Cervantes Institute in Madrid, you can turn it around. Another horribly difficult piece to do. Just ask Mario. <laughs> uh, but you can turn it, you can move it. You know? Napoleon. I don't know, I, I know I'm gonna get a lot of heck, but I can't stand the guy. And I know he's very important, and the movie did not do justice to him. Uh, but he's a guy that betrays the French Revolution, reinstates slavery. He's like the anti-Lincoln. He re-enslaves Haiti, you know? And he was very short. And he compensated by riding these enormous horses. <laughs> so Sakal, of course, was not going to glorify Napoleon. 
So he fuses him with the horse. But notice how he doesn't miss a detail. Napoleon used to wear these hats. And he used to have these poses where he stuck his hand like this. Huh? And if you look at the sculpture, it's carefully done where all the mannerisms of Napoleon's are there, the head of the horse, and at the same time, it's like a chess piece. Napoleon is perhaps the most brilliant military man in history. So there you have a, a fusion, a chess piece, a portrait, a horse. Or the great mime, Marcel Marceau. You probably have never seen Marcel Marceau. Uh, I think you have to be over 50, you know? Uh, but this was the greatest mime in the world. He could simulate a space, and he did these things like, like he was boxed in. You know, he's been very much imitated. You see, he's getting tighter, tighter. You can see him in YouTube, Marcel Marceau, he's very... And so, uh, Sakal's piece has the mask, has the box, and has the character. Another lesson for the students. Uh, you're not meant to do just one thing. Albert Einstein, perhaps the greatest scientist in the 20th century, I don't know if you know this, but he was also a good musician. And he loved to play the violin. And uh, some of his ideas of, of physics originated when he was playing the violin. And so, uh, in his portrait of Einstein, Sakal fuses the atom and the violin. And then he fuses Einstein with a note. He is a note as well. He also was very good at finding objects. So in Mexico there are these markets. Uh, Mario Torres sometimes accompanied him uh, to La Lagunilla and all these places where you could find old stuff. And sometimes he found things and these were the inspiration for other sculptures. Uh, so, for example, he found glasses that looked like Gandhi and does this portrait of Gandhi that is extraordinary. Now, Pablo Picasso used to say that people lie too much for lack of fantasy. Truth is also invented. What did he mean? mean? There's all this kind of realistic school that says that if you paint every pimple and everything you're doing a closer portrait, not necessarily. It's a bunch of terrible sculpture that is copies exactly every dimple and pimple in somebody's face, but sometimes misses the spirit, right? So Sakai was aware of all these types of sculptures. And so when he does his portrait of Gandhi, now, why is Gandhi important? Gandhi was a man that defeated the British Empire without firing one shot. The guy was emaciated. He didn't. And he just convinced his people not to, to buy salt or textiles until the Brits left. He is really the creator of the non-violence structure. Well, not, he's not really the creator. It's interesting that. The creators of the non-violence were people like Thoreau, Americans, the, the, the passive resistance, the refusing to, uh, the non-cooperation. That's an American idea. But then Gandhi uses it. And then Martin Luther King, takes it back to the U.S. So Gandhi had the strength of an elephant, but he was very flexible. And so the portrait that we have here, he combines uh, an, the, the, an elephant and a man. He has this big, 
strong, uh, you know, elephant part, and then the flexible, emaciated body with the glasses. Or in Gautemoc, the last Aztec emperor, he finds this wonderful collection of spoons, and he does the headdress of Gautemoc with spoons. It gives him a startling look. <laughs> I would have never thought of that. But it's not disrespectful. I mean, it's interesting. And Chaplin, he finds the, the skates. And the most famous scene of Chaplin, well, not the most famous, cannot say that, but one of the most famous is one that he's roller skating blindfolded. And it's like, I love this image. Look at it. So these are the roller skates, and, and this is his chapel. Lincoln. Lincoln is, is such a handsome man. I mean, now it maybe see, it seems to us. It is uh, said that when Lincoln was alive, uh, he was controversial. And somebody said, you are a two-faced, you are a two-faced liar. And Lincoln looked at it and said, look, lady, do you think that if I had two faces, I would be wearing this one? <laughs> <laughs> but what I say is that it's so easy to do a, a sculpture of Lincoln because his tracers, his long nose, his, you could just bring in the ham, right? But Sakal does not put his face. But he does find the chains. He, he and Sylvia, the, the, the Africans, were brought with these horrible chains in this passage of death through the Atlantic Ocean. And Sakal and Sylvia recreated all the, the journey of the salt, the journey of the slave, coming out of Africa enchained. These were the, the ships lying down, tied, many dying next to the other. And so, at the end of the war, Lincoln decides to abolish slavery. That politically was very difficult to do. There is a movie by Spielberg about that. And so that is what is important of Lincoln. But even more, Lincoln has a speech that today is probably more relevant than ever which is the Gettysburg speech, where after this battle that is just so many people die in Gettysburg, and he can see what's at stake. What's at stake is the future of democracy, like now. And so he uh, says, you know, that uh, that he prays that this will be bring a new burst of freedom. That these dead will have not died in vain. And that the government of the people, by the people and for the people, shall not perish from the earth. And so now when we are at the risk of another authoritarian government, when everything seems to indicate that we'll get it, I would like to play for you uh, the best rendition of the Gettysburg Address I have ever heard with Orson Welles. The recording is not very good, so I beg you to pay attention. Thank you. 
Another consequence of the Civil War was jazz. People wonder why did so much and great jazz happen after the 19th century and at the beginnings of the 20th and not anymore? Well, you see, all the, the armies had bands and the bands were full of instruments. You had trumpets and you had sax, all kinds of instruments. And many of these instruments were later abandoned in the fields. So it was possible for a poor black kid to find a beautiful trumpet. Now it's more difficult because that trumpet can cost you $10,000, $15,000. But the talent is there. Now, if the kid only has his voice, he does rap. Or whatever he can. The talent cannot be suppressed. But this encounter of wonderful instruments and talent produces the greatest original musical creation of this country, which is jazz. And one of the greatest performers is Louis Armstrong. And so uh, Sakal found one of these original trumpets of, of jazz that were abandoned. And so he does his tribute to, to Louis, but it would have been too easy to put him playing that trumpet. So he puts it above like an idea. And you can imagine uh, Louis playing it. But jazz exists before in the imagination. You know, the. And I can do what, for once, I can do what Sakal can't, which is I can give you the real Louis Armstrong. <laughs> Now, if Lincoln's Gettysburg Address is perhaps the greatest speech of the 19th century, I think that the greatest speech of the 20th century is Churchill's. One can argue that Kennedy's inaugural is also extraordinary, but I think that Churchill accomplished something that is hard to imagine, and that is an invincible speech. And uh, how did this sculpture came about? One of the symbols of the Nazis, of course you can use the swastikas, but that's done so much, are the, the Nazi helmet, uh, which is, one of the most resistant helmets ever created. I was speaking with uh, Mario Torres of Sakal's workshop, and he was saying how they found this helmet, this helmet that was part of the, war, well, the, 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 the German troops, this kind of elegant design. Uh, and it was almost impossible to pierce. And so the sculpture of Churchill combines the Nazi helmet and the rubble of the German bombings in Great Britain. And it's really remarkable, the courage of, of Winston Churchill. If you know your history, you will remember that the British were not enemies of the Germans. And even you have Chamberlain, the Prime Minister of Britain, 
in his appeasement policy, trying to uh, make good with the Nazis, even if they were invading Poland, in a shameful and cowardly exercise. So there were a lot of people. Hitler did not want to fight Britain. He didn't care about Britain. He wanted to go east. The Levisraum policy of the Nazis was aimed at conquering the vast oil fields in Russia. That's why he invades Poland and goes to the east. And there were a lot of people in Britain that didn't want to oppose the Germans. They knew that they did not have any way to resist the organized air power of the Germans. And so there's a lot of pressure for Churchill not to go to war, to appease the Nazis. And then in a moment of inspiration, Churchill decides to elevate the battle. And he creates a speech that is truly invincible and that prepares people for, for the worst. The audio is hard, so let me give you the words. He says, we shall fight them on the beaches. We shall fight them on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. And even if this island or a large part of it were subjugated and starving, then our empire beyond the seas, armed and guarded by the British fleet, would carry on the struggle until in God's good time, the new world with all its power and might steps forth to the rescue and liberation of the old. Because the US didn't want to get in the war either. And so it looked like we were gonna have a Nazi tyranny forever. That the entire Jewish European population would be exterminated forever and that the Nazis would have a, a European empire with all the resources of the East and lead the world into a perpetual darkness and slavery. In those circumstances, in five years, the Germany army would have been un unassailable. And so in that moment, that speech, I believe, saves the world. Because it sends clear a message to the, to the Nazis that Britain will never surrender. Even if the island is conquered, it will never surrender. And it throws to the Americans the glove of this isolationism. So let's listen to Churchill in this truly invincible speech. And so this is the tribute to Churchill. And I believe it's, it's one of the most moving and beautiful tributes to Churchill. There's a lot of detractors of Churchill, but I think that the world owes him a great deal. Sadly, uh, Sakal has an awful death. I remember he started slurring his words, and we had openings. And Pepe had to say, I'm not drunk. I just have, I have this problem. I think it's, 
an issue with my tongue. I, I don't. Because he sounded like, like if he had had uh, too much to drink. And slowly, the, the sickness advanced. And it, I don't know exactly what it was called, but it's one of these kind of Lou Gehrig things where you start to lose ALS. And uh, Sylvia did everything she could. I mean, they were, wherever they thought they had a treatment, whether it was Korea, wherever it was. Uh, and in his last sculptures, Sakal was trying to recreate what was happening to him. His uh, body that was, uh, it, normally it begins from the outside, but in Sakal's, he, he who loved to eat could no longer eat. Uh, he started to lose his facial, everything. And these are some of the last uh, sculptures where he tries to, to recreate his membranes and his deteriorated uh, brain cells. And even in, in this situation, he was honored, in, in Mexico, one of the greatest honors is that they make you, they put your photograph in the lottery. Mexico has a, a lottery that is very prestigious. It has done a lot of social work. It's very honestly managed. It's one of those great institutions. And for the lottery in Mexico, everybody buys a piece. To put your, your face at, it's like a big honor. You know? It's more than a public award. It's like a social recognition because that means that 60 million Mexicans will have you and will eagerly look at the ticket, hoping they are the winning ticket, right? So they gave this uh, uh, honor to Sakal. And by then he was very sick, but he did not hide. We took him as he was in a wheelchair and he was smiling and he, his presence was still there, even if the decay was obvious, no, but, uh, but he went there. And interestingly, he kept his hands to the last. He could, he could no longer speak. He could no longer eat. He had lost most of the movement of his body, except the hands. So he was able to continue doing sculpture to the very end. And one of his final works is his self-portrait that are these hands. And he called it simply me. Thank you very much. So if anybody has any comment or question. And uh, I would like to bring up to the stage uh, my colleagues Mario and Claire because they also knew Pepe very well. So, you know, uh, if I don't know a question, maybe they do. So, venganse. Uh, Claire has worked in the foundation for a long, long time. And uh, Mario uh, is uh, in the workshop. So he accompanied uh, Maestro Sakal everywhere. He helped him doing the, the sculptures. So uh, we have an unbeatable Sakal team. <laughs> Does anybody have any comments or questions that you would like to make? OK, but speak up loudly if you could. said that one of his first sculptures was lost, the end of his wife. I'm sorry, could you? What happened, what happened with, uh, no, not the migraine, with uh, the Venus? The Venus is still there. Esa que tiene el pelo así todo. Oh, the, the two Venus are here. 
it's one sculpture. Just the, the, the problem is that the guy thought that there were two Fridas, two separate sculptures, and didn't realize that it's one sculpture with uh, two vistas. You can turn it and it has two faces. And he, he thought it, that there were... It was so there was two and we were missing one. Two Fridas, it was only one. Any other comment or question? I have a question. Yes. So, obviously, Sakai is, you know, he benefited from, from the artist who came before him, who spoke to that. And with the foundation today and, and his workshop, what, what's happening for the future? Are there generations that are participating, working in the workshop, that artists that we could find? As long as Sakai still lives, which he is, because he's here and he's in a lot of uh, places, he will be there and for everybody. That's what we're trying to do when it's important. Guess what? what? What we're trying to do, and, and I think the foundation is doing a good job in that way, is, is to share the work. Uh, we don't make a penny <laughs> in all of these things. It's an effort to have the works here. And, uh, well, if it can inspire you to start doing sculptures, or it can, we hope so. That's why we do these things. Do you know who Sakao was? Uh, he was my cousin. I'm still guessing. But come to the microphone. Don't be out there. Sorry. <laughs> and, and, well, I know him since I was little. And he was a very special person. He had this uh, spirit of people getting in touch with his, um, his art. And he used to say, I want to bring um, the museums to the people because people don't go to the museums. So all the sculptures were outdoors and he wouldn't mind if somebody was touching them or playing with them. I remember I saw one of the, one guy stepping up in a sculpture and he was just laying down in the sculpture just like this. And I, Pepe, look what's happening. That's perfect. I love it. I want people to touch my, my art. And he was very happy about it. So here they are and there's no problem if you touch them, if you spin them, if you, whatever you want to do, he would love to see now people. Let's carried away with it. <laughs> Touching his art. That was his goal. And well, thank you very much. Any other comments yes. or questions? Could you speak up a little louder? Yes, we have a book. Yes, there is a several books of Sakha. She has it. Get the mic. Yes, there's a book. You could give Sandra your contact information. And you can. Yes. So, uh, Speak up a little louder. When, when, you, when you were showing the presentation of this work, we have just seen the final product, but like, I don't see the process of making it more So is there anything recorded so far? No, there's much more. The, if I were to do a whole, all, I mean, we would take several hours, it would be a seminar. Uh, a ver, here I have uh, Mario. Me preguntan, yo traduzco si sí, quieres, sí, sí. Eh, si está documentado el proceso creativo, si, si hay videos de él haciendo las obras, o cómo era. I think what you're asking is how was his creative process? Yeah, yeah, yeah. ¿Y cómo era su proceso creativo? Eh, el proceso creativo a grandes rasgos sí está documentado y a grandes rasgos sea. Él trabajaba con barro, directamente con barro. He worked originally with clay. Ajá. Porque le gustaba eh, la interacción con la materia viva. He loved to touch matter. Y este, uh, modelaba sobre el barro directo. Después ese modelado... So he el... modeled directly on the clay. Eh, ese, a ese modelado cuando estaba eh, afinado, terminado, se le hacía un molde. And so once he had finished the piece on clay, they made a, a mold. 
Ese molde eh, se le hacía un vaciado en cera para llevarlo a la fundición y pasarlo al bronce o algún otro material. And so then with that mold they did the wax process and then to bronze or whatever metal or material he chose. ¿Cuánto trabajaba? ¿Cómo era su día? Eh, empezábamos a trabajar 9 de la mañana y podíamos estar hasta las 10 de la noche. He started working at 9 in the morning, sometimes 10 o'clock at night. Todo el día. All day. And weekends as well. Para. Yo, yo estuve trabajando solamente, solamente yo, que era de los más jóvenes, 17 años. Just Mario, que es uno de los más jóvenes, 17 años con él. Desde que estaba en la universidad. En la universidad. Él estuvo casado por 50 años con Silvia. Así que cuando estaba empezando a ir a la escuela médica, He, oh, behind the scenes or in secret, he was studying um, art school. Nobody knew but Sylvia. And um, I, I would say if they were married 50 years, he was working on this for 30 years or more, more than that. Any other comment, question? Yes. A ver, eh, me pregunta, ¿cómo era la vida de Pepe? ¿Cómo era la vida creativa de él? ¿Cuál era su actitud? Eh, era muy espontáneo. Eh, por ejemplo, llegaba algunos días en las mañanas. It was very spontaneous. Sometimes he came in the mornings. Y nos decía, eh, soñé que... O tuve un sueño acerca de, no sé... Eh, eh, tal personaje, ¿no? Un personaje. I dreamed eh, of Bex person. Y este, y soñé que este, no sé, estaba tocando una trompeta como con Armstrong, ¿no? Or I dreamed that I was playing the trumpet like Louis. Y empezaba eh, su inspiración era el trabajo. And his inspiration was developed through the work. I remember. Em sí. Empezaba a, tra a trabajar eh, sobre la idea eh, en papel, a dibujar. Dibujaba poco, es, este Hacía un sketch y de inmediato lo pasaba al barro. And so then he started drawing and then he passed the drawing to the clay. Y, y así. Every sin time, parar. every time he had a, a grandson or grand grandchildren, he was inspired to make animals. You know, like the pink bunnies because uh, he had a, a, a grandchild girl or. Um, I don't know, all, 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 all kinds of animals and the little, uh, it's not rata, mouse, mice, little mice, and mm -hmm. all inspired for, uh, for his grandchildren. I remember at one point he telling me that, you know, the good, that it is very important that you only have to make two correct decisions in life. You have to marry right and you have to choose something that you love to do. And if you choose something that you love to do, you will not work a single day of your life. That's it. Because everything will be part of the same joy process. And so I remember him very free guy, a person that, uh, I, and I think that his, I don't want to call it aloofness, but his unconcern for the merchandising of his art was also a great de-stressor, right? Because he, I mean, the, obviously, like anybody else, he had to make a living and he did it, but it was not this obsession of, oh, this, this piece costs more than the last one and will I do this or will I sell it or will, I, will it not sell or will my market collapse because now I'm doing animals and what will the critics say? And he gave it down. I don't think he cared about, uh, he, 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 he liked to have fun, having fun doing the works. Uh, he was very open. If he had a dream or something, or if uh, a little kid visited him and he could do an animal, uh, you could interact with him. Uh, he's got these lovely pieces that he did with music. 
Like he had, uh, I think, Eleanor Rigby and Beatles music, and he had sculptures that moved uh, that are lovely. He had... Um, Yes, Beatles pieces. He did uh, hearts, a lot of hearts. Larry King uh, ha had this award for a heart foundation mm -hmm. and, and asked Sakal if he could do a trophy for him. And I remember me telling Sakal, don't do that. Because I said, that's going to be the end. How can anybody do a Valentine and not look ridiculous? I mean, he's going to flounder with that one. I mean, I thought, he came up with some hearts that were so beautiful that Larry King could not take his head, eyes. It was just marvelous. And then uh, immediately, oh, well, let's send one to all the cardiology hospitals and one to here. And we, no, we lost interest. Next. So I think that this lack of worry, which is not to say, I'm not advising anybody not to be disciplined cannot accomplish anything in life if you don't work hard, if you don't dedicate yourself. I'm not saying that. But I think that sometimes we add to our life unnecessary stress because we worry about things that are not that important. And so by eliminating artificial concerns, some of the things that torture artists are, you know, the prices of your work and uh, what the critics will say and all these things that you can't really control. You can't really control what somebody's going to write about your work. You can't really control your market, you know? So you do your best, you work hard, you are sincere with what you're doing, and you love what you're doing, and that's it. The rest, well, life happens, right? Somebody, yeah, you were saying? A little bit louder. I'm sorry. I know I was just um, commenting to my lovely friend here about kind of what you were talking about about uh, art and I just told her just a minute ago that money fucks up art in the sense that when you when you deal with when you think about money too much as an artist, I do, then it screws with your with the mess with your brain too much. If you don't care about I believe that you become a better artist. Not that there's not artists out there who can't deal with money and, and do well. But uh, the, the question I had was, was he religious? And did he, I'm sorry to ask this, did he drink or did he indulge in any kind of spirit? I, I mean, I think Claire would be better at answering that. I, 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 he was very knowledgeable of the Bible. He knew it right, left and right. Uh, I don't know how religious he was. That's something that Claire can tell you. I do remember that once he invited me uh, to uh, this Jewish uh, celebration. I had no idea what it was. And uh, Pepe came up with all these uh, prayers. And, uh, I just, <laughs> I, I was just bewildered. And he gave me one of these hats uh, that are that I keep to this day as it wasn't my prized possessions but but uh, we had all these dishes and this and it was very good natured I, I don't I don't know was he very religious no <laughs> he, knew, he knew a lot about religion sure. he had his own but religion we he was inspired by a uh, um, I remember se inspiró en, en cómo se llama el libro que te, en, but he was not religious no, that's right, yeah. he knew everything about religions and, and, and he used to while he was making the sculpture we were just sitting around or he was working with them and he was talking about everything and he was very knowledgeable he knew a lot but he was not religious and then let me say something to the, our students here. I'm not encouraging anybody to go on a hippie uh, spiritual trail and don't worry about money. You have to worry about money. You have to make a living, of course. Uh, and Sakal was able to do, make a living, and we all do. And it would be irresponsible uh, to tell you with a straight face that money doesn't matter. It would be false. I'm not saying that. What I, what I, what I say is that one has to be able to live a balanced life 
and to be able to find happiness, not just in the economic rewards, but also in the activity itself. The action itself has to be beautiful, has to be rewarding, has to make you happy. Yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't part of that. <laughs> 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 Baruch Espinosa. Baruch Espinosa is the name. Baruch Espinosa. Yeah, he was inspired by right? yeah. him. Yeah. Any other comment or question? No? Well, in that case, I think that the best thing we can do is actually go and look at the sculptures. And touch them. And touch them. Yeah. Feel them. But be careful. <laughs> Don't push them. <laughs> no, exactly. No, please. <laughs> so, yeah, thank great. you. Please. Really quick, uh, we're going to use this chance that uh, personalities and authorities and our guests are present to celebrate just a little other piece of this uh, relationship between our college, our university, and the Consulate of Mexico and Mexico. Uh, last uh, November to January, we had an exhibition, a collective exhibition, and some of the artists are here. So I, with the help of our guests and our consul, please, uh, we're going to mention the names of, uh, well, we're going to give the certificates of participation to the people who is here, but I have every, everybody else's uh, uh, here safe. Um, I want to call Deborah Casolis to receive a certificate of participation from the Mexican uh, consulate. Thank you so much. <laughs> Joe Byrne as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, um, but we have a group of people that participated on behalf of CAPLA. So I'm going to read all the names, although not all of them are here, but it's very important that we know that our, our community, our CAPLA community was represented there. So, Nathaniel Vicente. <laughs> Sadia Tasmin. <laughs> Both the students here at the college. Christopher Tucker is one of our instructors. He's not here, but I wanted to read her name, his name. <laughs> Dr. Altaf Engineer, excellent artist, by the way. <laughs> Thank you so much. Our um, dear architect is in red, retiree and now experimenting with art created by artificial intelligence, Damon Labert, he's also not here. And also uh, from a studio, Valerie Lane also participated. So I just wanted to make this public because it's another adventure, another crazy idea that we had and this successful and it's happened because of the support of the college and the consulate. So thank you very much. Please enjoy some treats and enjoy the sculptures. Thank you for staying here. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yes, of course. Thank Please, you. take it away. Good evening. Um, I am, my name is Robin, and I'm with the with Sculpture Tucson that was a part of the magic of this collaboration. That is just this magic of the collaboration that's can, gone on to have these pieces here with the Mexican Consulate, with the, the Sakal Foundation, with the University of Arizona, with Sandra, it, truly, it's a chapter in a book, and it's a really good one, and I hope we get to write it. And I'd like to just take a moment on behalf of Sculpture Tucson, and before you leave back to Mexico, um, present a certificate of gratitude and appreciation for excellence in international art collaboration to the Foundation of Jose Sacal. And um, presided by Sylvia Sacal, and on behalf of our board, Thank you for collaborating to bring the work of Jose Sacal to our community, to provide an opportunity for viewers to consider how the art empowers a deeper understanding that which is unique and that which is universal. Thank and we you. love you and we thank you. And the first time I met you, you were coming out of a U-Haul with all this art <laughs> with three in stilettos. And I thought, this is so badass woman. <laughs> so, <laughs> so thank you for everything. Thank you for um, all, all the magic.
just give you that. Well, and also, the, yes. The name of Sylvia, I mean, I'm just yes. representing uh, the foundation, but this is for Sylvia. And it was a joy to meet Sylvia. It, the stories that just brought everything to life. And I do remember one thing, I know we're getting to the art. Um, I, I remember her saying something that when you went through the foundry, that there were how many molds, how many hundreds of molds? Yeah. Like, literally it was like 700 or 800, 800 molds that were, uh, and that just is mind blowing when you talk about the amount of work. And also is David Hatchwell yes. here? Yes. No, he's he, not here. Yes, but you but can bring this a, from yes. the Foundation Hispano Judia. Hispano Judia. I, and to, if you would bring that to. I'll give it to him, him. and thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Great for to honor. work with you, and thank you for letting us to be, be a part of this wonderful. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.